So that's the major difference for us is that the water is in the reservoir and we're heating it using the EM energy. If you'll uh, consider coming back on when we're, you sort of reach the next stage. We're able to virtually eliminate, well we totally eliminate the heating parts. So there's no steam boiler, no steam plant at all. Good morning and welcome to episode five of Crownsman Energy. Today, we are joined by two guests. We have Mike Trini. He is the VP of Commercialization. And we also have Laura McIntyre. She is the VP of Engineering at Acceloware. They're here to discuss the technology and the future for the oil and gas sector. But before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. We are sponsored by Sav Savannah Equipment. Are you working on pipelines, oil and gas projects, renewable energy or LNG, and you need to save some cash? Well, Savannah Equipment has industrial pumps, electrical equipment from motors to transformers, and even surplus pipe and much, much more available now. Visit SavannahEquipment.com to view all their available inventory. Again, SavannahEquipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. We're also sponsored by PowerZone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit PowerZone.com. Well, now let's get started with episode five of Crownsman Energy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crownsman Energy. We are fully underway with the show now. We've done multiple episodes. We've got great feedback from you, the audience, and we have more great companies coming up. Today, we have Acceloware on the show, and this is going to be an interesting show because usually we have one guest at a time, but just from the setup, we want it, and the information we wanted to gather from Acceloware, it just made sense to have two. So we have Mike Torini, he is the VP of Commercialization, and Laura McIntyre, who is the VP of Engineering. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with Laura. Laura's going to walk us through sort of the technical side of Acceloware, which is very, very interesting. Um, and we've got some videos in that that we're going to pop up on the screen to give you a visual of what's happening. Um, I know we have a lot of guests, you know, the, or uh, audience, sorry, that watch from across all industries. So it, it's going to be a nice visual that will actually help you see the technology as Laura's explaining it. And then Mike is going to come on the show on the second half and just talk about how Acceloware is going to expand into the market, grow their business, things like that. So it's going to be very interesting. We're going to start off with Laura. Laura, hello, and welcome to Crownsman Energy. Hi, Jared. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's going to be very interesting. And um, I've got lots of notes here because there's a lot of information I want to cover and pack in to only an hour show. So um, can we just start off with, let's start off with the technology. Let's get that set up first, just so the audience knows what we're talking about. Yeah, no, for sure. So Acceloware is a electromagnetic heating company with a focus on developing reservoirs that are typically um, produced using steam, gravity drainage, cold flow. Um, our technology will allow us to access reservoirs that are currently um, being developed using uh, SEG-D, but also uh, additional practices. Um, our technology uses electromagnetic energy. We have an RF converter on surface. So it's kind of like a, a microwave system that generates energy and translates it down into the reservoir um, through two coax cables. And so if you think of a typical well, you have, um, you'd have your lines from surface and you'd inject into a horizontal for a D well. Our lines actually uh, communicate the electricity down to the reservoir at the heel. So, so, okay. So I want to go and I'm going to, we, we're going to bring that video up and we can actually walk through that a little bit, but um, I want to go just quickly jump back. So wh where does the history of Acceloware, where, where did it all start and develop? I mean, radio frequency technology is not obviously not a new thing, um, but can you talk a little bit about how Acceloware brought it into as a company and into the market? 
For sure. Yeah, you're right. So um, using radio frequency has been around for over 50 years. Um, typically what they used to do was use commercial or military grade units. Um, and it's been, they're always in the past very expensive to operate, not very efficient. Um, mm -hmm. The experts at Acceloware that we work with recognize the limitations of this technology. And it also been seeing other trials going on in industry. We were contacted by a U.S. super major oil company uh, about five or six years ago to do a postmortem on their RF pilot. And from that, we understood, hmm, we could also develop something similar um, that's highly efficient and at a lower frequency, lower cost. Right. So Acceloware, they were, where were they sort of specializing in leading up to that before that company contacted? So we were founded in 2004 and the start of our company was mainly on software. We mm. used GPUs as a computing platform. It was all about high speed processing. Uh, we also then stepped into high speed seismic. Um, and then, as I mentioned, once we were contacted by this company in 2010, that's when we shifted into a focus on oil and gas development. And then, so when you made that shift now, uh, and I, I know you, you're, you are a publicly traded company. Is that, that's correct, right? Correct. Yeah. So I, I understand that, uh, you know, there's obviously some information that's, you know, if I'm asking something that's out of line, just let me know. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so that project, was that, um, was that a, a funded project? Was that an R and D, a partnership? How did that develop for a company like that coming to you and, and wanting to develop this uh, technology? Uh, yeah, no, that was, um, as I mentioned, a U.S. super major. So they were, um, it, was, uh, it was a public company, again, down in the States, and they contacted us to utilize our expertise um, as right. a consultant basis. So that was in 2010. Now, fast forward to 2017. Now, did you develop based off of that, um, that project with them? Then, then what was the next step that went forward that I think you ended up in 2017, you ended up doing sort of a, I think I got some notes here, like a 120th scale project. Can you sort of go give that timeline? For sure. So since 2010, a uh, significant investment in research and development, understanding current RF type practices. If you look into industry, there's, um, you'll see a lot of electrical type subsurface development. They use induction right. and conduction. Um, a dipole antenna is, is kind of your most common approach to using RF energy. And there's significant limitations to this in terms of length of your well, um, efficiency, cost as well. So that's where we took upon the challenge to figure out how we could do it differently. Right. And then, so that, that process, so in 2000, so I want to go just through the next sort of stage. Now you've gotten 2018. Um, you've gotten, there's a big focus on design, execution, planning. Um, and then you got an agreement with, uh, I think Bro Broadview Energy. I'm just trying to find it here on the notes here. Can you just talk about like, sort of where you're at right now? And then I want to circle back and go into the technology itself. For sure. No, um, this has been a really big year for us. So we announced a partnership with Broadview, um, as you mentioned, to do our pilot in their Mar Wayne area, which is just north of Lloydminster in Alberta. Um, it's a heavy oil reservoir. Leading up to this, I was brought into the company in 2018. I have a background in the thermal development side. I've worked uh, um, in quite a few SEGD operations and I was brought in to do the project management. So what we have done is further developed the well design uh, as you mentioned, we did some testing in the subsurface of 120th design, or sorry, 120th scale test. We've more recently done um, a one quarter test, you could call it. Our full scale power would be two megawatts. We've more, rec more recently ramped up to almost 500 kilowatts. So Laura, I was on the website and I saw the, the video you have. It's quite a nice, nice um, walkthrough of, of how the technology actually works. Are you able to just, we'll bring it up on the screen for the audience. Are you able to just walk us through that process? Definitely. Well, that'd be, it's a great visual. So taking a look at our, our well design, uh, we have an upper and a lower well. The upper section that you're seeing are the RF heating lines. So they are two parallel lines that run up to a thousand meters in length. 
And essentially these lines connect up to the surface power supply, which you see is the blue box. Uh, how these heating lines work is an underground microwave. They're heating the conate water in the subsurface. So that's the major difference for us is that the water is in the reservoir and we're heating it using the EM energy. The production well is below those two heating lines and it's identical well-designed configuration to a standard SAGD well. You'd have a slotted liner that connects uh, up to surface. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about, because a version of the technology has been off, and I, I know you've sort of already touched on it, but I just wanna unpack it a little more. And then what, what is separating Acceloware technology that makes it an efficient process um, using this method? So a waterless technology is huge. Um, in my past roles, um, accessing fresh water is not only an environmental concern, it's becoming more difficult to find um, these resources, the water uh, wells close to the plants. Um, so a waterless environment is huge for us. We're also not required to create the steam, so the GHG reduction. Um, also the footprint, if you have a full steam plant, um, which we wouldn't require, we'd only be the oil processing side. It's about 60% lower in terms of footprint. You know, when you're, when you're doing a design like this and implementing this in, uh, into a, a major industry, obviously you're gonna have some collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about the partnerships um, that Acceloware has developed uh, to get, get things moving? Definitely. So the, as our well design is si similar to a typical SAG-D well, we're utilizing a lot of commonly known products and accessing service companies that have significant experience already in the thermal industry. Um, for some of our not so common parts, um, we've partnered with Airbus as one of the companies um, because of their expertise in fiberglass development and engineering. So they've been excellent to work with as well as GE Global Research. They were our partners in developing our RF converter unit at Surface. Right. And so I just, I just want to touch on that a little bit more though, because these, these partners, how does that collaboration work, you know, as you're, as you're developing, do you reach out to them? Is there sort of, uh, are there channels you go through that looking for partners? I mean, these are, you know, it's, it's obviously very important to have the partnerships. Um, how does Acceloware, you know, manage to sort of put all these together over the years? Yeah, it's, I mean, we're a small team. Um, it definitely requires a lot of research on our end and, you know, learnings. We've, we've explored various partnerships that some worked out and some are better than others, but we're looking to pull in experts. Um, GE was brought in uh, due to their expert on the electrical side and mm -hmm. the silicon carbide transistor was one that they were able to bring to us in our development. Um, Airbus has been great. And then there's many others. I mean, common um, names that everyone would be familiar with, the Weatherfords, um, Sanjil, CES, companies that we use that are commonly um, partnered with, with industry. Right. What, this is about, might be a little bit of a tricky question, but I, I am curious, you know, how, how much from the day one of the concept of the idea from that, that time, the, that super company out of the U.S. Uh, starts the project with you um, to now, how much has the technology or the implementation of the technology evolved? Oh, immensely. Um, for us, it was starting with a lot of simulation and then we've moved it into doing a lot of lab work as well, which has been critical. Our group is extremely hands-on. That's something that I've been impressed with in working with this team. So it's been very iterative. iterative. As soon as we think we have a solution, we then you know, find another problem. So um, we do a ton of hands-on testing. We have a shop that we work with um, as well as the field trials. So constant learnings. And, you know, I always kind of joke, I'm like, innovation is, is a windy road and, and you're out there getting your hands uh -huh. dirty for sure. Is it, uh, there's a safety element to this too, though, isn't there? Um, and, I, and I wanted to touch on that, you know, as we sort of go, we've went through the technology and then we'll, we'll go into Mike of sort of expanding it. Um, but I want to touch on it because it is a re very real element. And can you walk through that a bit? Yeah, for sure. This is one of our most commonly asked questions. I think, um, you know, being 
to many, it's, it's not a common technology, but um, if you think about it, we're constantly surrounded by radio frequency waves. If you, your hairdresser, your photocopier, your AM radio, um, looking at the hair, hair dryer is kind of a good example. It's 1 40th of the field that you'd see from your hair dryer that would be generated by, by our unit. Um, overhead power lines is another example. So we're constantly surrounded by these radio waves. In terms of site safety, we will have sensors um, completely around the surface unit along the length of the well. So safety is very critical to us. Right. Um, where, and I, again, going back to that development stage, over the years as you've, as you've been developing it, um, was like these safeties, these sensor, as technology has continued to evolve outside of what you're doing, how much has been brought in? I mean, going back to the partnerships with companies like GE, um, has, it, has it been a process where you hear about a technology and then you realize, oh, that can be applicable to, you know, this sensor will work um, for measuring this and for providing safety here and that, that sort of thing. Has that been part of the process? Uh, I think as we move more into full-scale pilot development, we will definitely see more learnings there. Um, we'll be using a lot of the common industry safety measurement tools on surface um, in terms of you know, H2S generation, if that's a requirement, depending on the reservoir. But um, yeah, standard operating practices will be uh, critical for us. I want to talk, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the current day application, um, what, what is, Eddie, again, I know you touched on it, and I'm sort of pulling out things that as, as you go through it, but why is there actually such a big advantage to limiting the amount of water that's going to be used um, in this process, especially, I mean, uh, noticeably in Alberta, um, but, but, but anywhere? Why is it important? Yeah, um, it's become increasingly difficult for operators, especially as development continues to expand. Um, you see one company next door to another company and they have um, issues with pressure in terms of your aquifer as we're drawing down. You're, we're injecting significant amounts of water currently into these SAG-D reservoirs and we're recycling it back to surface. Um, it's, the water usage is immense right now. And that's becoming under greater scrutiny uh, from government regulation. So that's going to become more and more stringent. Yeah. And there's also a reduction in land use as well. Is that right? Definitely. So if you think of a full scale uh, SAG D CPF central processing facility, a majority of the plant consists of water processing. That is really the truly difficult part of uh, the thermal industry is separating the oil from the water once it comes to surface. So they have numerous stages of water processing, which will be eliminated um, as we no longer require to create the fresh water to re-inject into the well. And then the, the next part is that it pairs, that your, your technology, the design uh, pairs well with uh, energy sources like solar and things like that. So can you touch on that a little bit as well? Definitely. The greener the source, um, obviously the further reduction in GHG. If we go to completely solar, um, then we would have a zero GHG scenario, which is ideal. Right. So I want to, you know, I, th I think, um, and I want to, thank you for coming on. And I, I'm going to bring Mike on now um, to sort of walk through that next stages um, of the, of the, uh, of where the company is going to take it and expanding and things like that. Um, but, but before I do, with this technology, how far, uh, you know, you, when you go from pilot to full scale, um, is, there, is there a limit? I, I don't know if this question makes sense, but is there, is there how much larger can it be scaled um, or, or how much more technology is going to have to go in before it can operate at full scale is maybe a better way of answer, asking it. The pilot that we're planning with Broadview will be um, full scale. We're planning to inject two megawatts okay. into the ground. So it's a substantial step towards full commercialization. 
and the vision as water usage becomes increasingly difficult. I see this as a game changing opportunity for operators to start to slowly integrate uh, this into current operations and for future a shift towards using electricity in place of water. You know, I did, I, before, before I let you go, I, I read through your bio on LinkedIn and just some of the, it's, it's, you've, you've been in the industry quite a while. Um, it's, it must be pretty interesting to be a part of this type of technology, um, the, the belly, like a, a, an actual innovative thing that's coming into the industry. Um, can you just touch on that? What, what it's like after being, having a, a, a good career in the oil and gas and energy sector to now be involved in this? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Jared. I, what I was seeing is we weren't really evolving as an industry. Uh, we were just repeating kind of the same, the same operating approach um, to be forward thinking and um, is huge. It's, we've been kind of recycling the same ideas because it's, um, it's risk adverse, but we're really encouraging, you know, in order to improve, we need to start to take some risks and try new technologies. And that, and for us, that's really our, um, our number one motive is to, to get out there and, and to do the pilot and to prove our technology. So it reduces some of the risks that people see with new technology. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Well, thank you, Laura. I'm going to jump over to Mike now and, uh, and pick his brain a little bit, but, but thank you for coming on and walking us through the technology side. Cause it'd be a little tough if we didn't have that to practice the next part of the discussion. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Mike. How's it going? Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Jared. Uh, going well. Thanks very much for having us today. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great. I want to, uh, I just want to kick off right now. Can you just talk about your role with the company and sort of the setup for some of the topics that we're going to be going through in the next few minutes? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I'm the VP of commercialization uh, for RF heating. And so my job has been to help take the concept that we developed and that's evolved over the past 10 years and turn that into a real commercial product, product um, through a number of projects along the way. So it's involved getting the partners like Broadview involved in finding the places to test and the other partnerships that we needed to to develop and progress the commercialization of the technology. I was curious, well, how, did you, how did you end up uh, involved with Acceloware? I, I originally came in to the company in 2013 and as Laura mentioned, we had some seismic software. We still sell that product today. So I came in to run marketing and sales for the company and do some work productizing and growing the base of sales for the seismic software. And as we kept going, we really recognized that this early idea around RF heating was the biggest growth opportunity the company had. And so we began to focus more attention on that uh, part of the business. And then I stepped into a full-time role looking for partners, funding, and other ways to progress that, that product. Right. So what I'd like to understand, Mike, is just right off the top and help the audience understand is what Acceler is trying, Acceler is trying to do uh, from a capital cost reduction in the oil and sands industry, um, the oil and sands industry. Can you, can you just unpack that a little bit for, for us? Absolutely. So if we start by, by referencing what Laura was talking about around the way this technology works, where we're injecting electricity, we're heating the water that's already in the ground. We don't have to add water to the formation to, to deliver the heat. So the status quo is SAG D and in that model, the steam that you're using is generated at surface with a bunch of water, heated up using the burning of natural gas and then injected to the formation. And in order to do that, you need a pretty significant steam plant. You need a lot of water processing equipment and then you inject that into the ground we're able to virtually eliminate, well, we totally eliminate the heating parts. So there's no steam boiler, no steam plant at all. And the water processing is vastly reduced. So in a lot of the oil sands reservoirs, you're injecting three barrels of steam for every barrel of oil you take out. So there's all that water going in the ground and it comes back out. So you keep circulating that, cleaning it and trying to reuse as much as you can. That all costs a lot of money. So we can simplify mm -hmm. that right down to our RF converter it sits at the wellhead and it runs for the life of that well and then you pick it up and move it to the next well. So on, right. on the dollar side, if you're looking at the steam model, SAG-D will cost something from thirty-six dollars to $40,000 for every flowing barrel so to build that plant and get started. So if you look at a 10,000 barrel plant, that's three hundred and sixty dollars to $400 million just to get going. 
And we're able to take that down typically by a factor of half. So we'd be down around $18,000 per flowing barrel. So a massive change in the, in the initial investment required to get started. Um, so, okay. So now I want to talk about um, the operating costs as well, because I mean, obviously that's a major factor in the, this, and I, I don't, I don't quite have an understanding of this. So I'm, I'm glad because I, I spent some time on your site and, and I wanted to understand it. Um, there's actually a, uh, is there a labor reduction factor that comes in here as well? Yeah. So there's, you know, some of the big advantages are the energy efficiency. As Laura talked about, there's the heat loss that we don't have. We get more of the energy you start with at the surface in the ground that helps drive down operating costs as well as environmental performance. But because our power, our heat is generated with our RF converter, it's sitting in a, in a healthy sized box at the wellhead, but it doesn't have a lot of touch. You don't need steam engineers. You don't need a lot of people 24 seven to monitor it and manage it. It's able to be remotely managed. We can monitor what's going on on that device. And then if something's going to go wrong, we can get an alarm and send somebody out to fix it. So there's a lot less touch. It, it's a lot more automated and easy to, to control remotely. But then, then you get the end result too. I mean, there, Accelerator actually has a goal to have um, a, a better product at the end. Can you walk us through that a little bit as well? Yeah, I think, you know, I think if you're talking about the ability to get the oil out of the ground more efficiently, you know, that, that has been part of the design here. We, we've always viewed that as long as there's a need for oil production, whether that's for combustion for fossil fuels or other emerging opportunities like rare earth elements or, or um, carbon fiber production, that kind of stuff. We want to be as clean as possible. And so we want to be able to keep the robust, strong, you know, bulletproof nature of what people put in the ground in SAG D, all the pipe and all of the things that have been learned over the last 20 years. But we want to make that cleaner and faster and simpler to roll out at the surface. So trying to figure out how we can be more modular and simpler in how you deploy the equipment you can move the equipment again each of our rf converters will have a life of 20 to 30 years so we want to make it easy for an operator to drill one well produce that well once it's done they can pick that asset up and move it to another location and keep using it so those right. are part of the designs we're, we're working on to test and you know we're even looking to pull some of our past experience as laura mentioned we were uh, involved in a lot of high performance computing and some exposure to the artificial intelligence and machine learning space we're going to add that mm -hmm. kind of intelligence onto the production. So we have our own simulation software that predicts what happens when you put this energy in the ground and that product X heat ties into CMG stars, which is the really the dominant reservoir modeling software in the, in the heavy oil and oil sand production space. So it ties together with that to predict what's going to happen when we put a certain amount of energy into a specific reservoir. Over time, we'll be able to add machine learning and that kind of artificial, art, sorry, artificial intelligence benefit of fine tuning how operators can get more production with less energy and less cost. So that's a, that's a pretty good explanation. But I also there was I saw some note somewhere that there was it will actually, but there will be an increase um, also of the a, a amount of oil that is um, that your technology is able to extract. Is that, is that, do I have that right? Um, yeah. on, and on an oil field, there will be an increase. Yeah, it's actually more, it's not so much in a given oil field, but where the massive change is, is in the barrels that can be accessed. So if you look at the restrictions around the current technology, say steam assisted gravity drainage, as Laura said, you're injecting a lot of steam at high pressure. And what that means is in order to protect all the layers of the earth and the surface, um, you can't have steam exploding through to the top really is, is the basic premise. And so you need a fair right. bit of rock, you need a lot of distance, so you need to be deep. Um, so you're looking at kind of 100, 150 meters or, or deeper. And so there's still a lot of oil above 150 meters uh, that is currently inaccessible. There's no technology that can produce that oil. There's great reservoirs, but nobody has ever had a technology to touch those reservoirs. So our technology can run at lower pressure so we can access those. In fact, we, we think we can support production from reservoirs all the way up to the reservoirs that have been mined to date. So as shallow as 50 meters deep, we could right. without digging up the earth, without creating all that kind of disturbance and emissions and cost. 
we can use this technology to produce from a whole bunch of different reservoirs. So it's not so much that we're going to get more oil out of a given reservoir, but we will be able to give operators the choice to go and cherry pick from all these untouched reservoirs. And when they do that, they may be able to pick better reservoirs, which means better production rates and lower energy required to produce that. So it, it gives them a chance to produce better barrels, not necessarily more, but they will be more profitable barrels and their environmental impact will be lower. Right. That, that, Laura touched on it a little bit and I wanted to, to talk about it with you a little bit more as well. I mean, anybody listening to this, they're going to see the video, Laura's explanation of the technology, walking through the processes. I mean, there's going to be that question of scalability. And can you, can you touch on that a little bit more? Um, it's obviously a very important part uh, of any technology that, that's coming into a major market like the oil and gas industry. Definitely, yeah. So I, I'm going to talk about scalability in, in two directions, actually, Jared. So, so one piece of scalability that's a differentiator compared to things like SAG-D is that we can go smaller. So if you look at typical SAG-D deployments, in order to get the economies of scale out of that steam plant investment and all of the infrastructure you require, you normally have to be 10,000 barrels a day in size to make that economically viable and, and reasonably profitable. So that's a bit of a barrier in that you're then spending four to $500 million just to get going. With the RF technology, you can go out and drill a single pad or, or even just prove out a single well, put a converter there, heat it up, produce the oil, prove out what you're going to get for oil production, and then scale one well at a time if you want to. You don't have these big step functions of needing to build um, capacity in 10,000 barrel a day chunks. So that's the, the downward scalability. We're, we can really grow in a linear fashion so we can support really the entry of small and, and junior players in the oil sand space where usually you've had to be pretty big to start writing a $500 million check. Right. Um, yeah, and so in terms of the other scalability to grow up and be able to support larger operators on larger scale, that's a real benefit we see on our commercialization path is the way we've built the technology. So when you look at the subsurface side, as Laura mentioned, we're using a lot of the same components, the same materials that have been proven and tested hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in the mm -hmm. psyche space. So we're trying to copy and use all of the things that we know are robust and strong and are going to survive the deployment into an oil sand or heavy oil reservoir. Then you pull that up to the surface and our partnership with GE gives us this nice clean converter technology. We need to bring power into that box and connect it to the wellhead. So in terms of our limitations and growth, there aren't many. We can take that design. So GE and Acceloware have worked together to develop this design. It's now a, an Acceloware proprietary design and we can get that manufactured. So you know, we, we can get the electronics turned around, crank out a bunch of those converter units, connect them up to all of these fairly standardized downhole components, and it gives us the ability to scale quickly once we get this pilot done and prove that it works and that we produce what we expect to produce, we've got a chance to grow that as quickly as demand comes in. There's another, ele there's another element that um, is that, and, and Laura did touch on it a little bit as well, is that there's an expansion of the technology of what it can be used to extract um, things like hydrogen and uh, carbon fiber, rare earth elements, things like that. I, and I, I wanted to be clear on it because I wasn't quite sure. Um, and, and I wanted to see if you could, if you could expand on that element of it a little bit more. Yeah. So I think when we, we look at the opportunity for the technology in this, in the, I guess the traditional way of looking at oil deposits, is to produce oil that's used primarily for a fossil fuel to, to be used in a combustion engine, whether it's a car, a truck, or a plane, or a boat. Um, that's, that's really the base. There's some use for asphalt and other commercial construction equipment or materials, but, but that's the market. And we, you know, we, we don't want to get into the debate or be, need to be part of the debate around how long we're going to need that fuel and how long the right. global demand is going to stay high. But the really exciting thing is the emerging demand for some of these other products. So carbon fiber is critical in manufacturing lightweight vehicles and, and materials that can support the kind of construction growth that's expected in the future. And it just happens that a lot of those carbon molecules that you could use to build carbon fiber are sitting in the ground in heavy oil and oil sand deposits. So right now there's a lot of work going on to figure out how we could alter the way we produce oil sand and heavy oil to make sure we're getting more of that 
piece of the, uh, of the compounds, all the, the mix of what's inside that oil, uh, get that out of the ground. And same thing with rare earth elements, lithium and some of the other elements that are critical for batteries for um, all the 5G electronics that are gonna be hitting the, hitting the world in the coming years. They're all in there in trace amounts. And so different ways to produce that material, filter that material, extract the key things we want, and then likely put, either leave the carbon in the ground or put it back in the ground. So you would have these products coming out that are critical to our future economies and you're no longer really using it in a way that burns, uh, burns the fuel and creates carbon. So uh, some really cool articles recently uh, from Mark Little of Suncor and Laura Kilcrease at Alberta Innovates where they were benchmarking the value of just the carbon fiber market as four times the value of the oil sand right now in terms of the revenue that it could generate. So wow. quadruple the opportunity in Canada. Do you, and I want to, you know, it's, it's, it's so nicely. And I, I would, by the way, anybody watching, I really would encourage people to go to your website because there, there's good information. I mean, uh, of course people would have watched this, but uh, there, there's more, more information, more videos and, and information on your YouTube channel and your website. And I encourage people to go to it and it sort of walk through talking to you both, you Mike and talking to Laura, it struck me, um, and again, I'm always keeping in mind our audience, um, and it shifts from episode to episode depending on people's interest. But do you think, just, just as an opinion, do you think that the energy sector um, could do better at, and that's probably part of the reason you're coming on the show, and I realize that, um, but how much better could the energy sector do and the oil and gas sector specifically letting people know the advancements that are being made in the technology. Because, you know, as we start this show, I mean, it's opened up a whole world to me. And I've, I mean, I'm <laughs> very openly a supporter of the energy sector. Yeah. Um, and it was a whole new world that opened up to me. Um, so how much better does the energy sector need to do to be letting people know that aren't necessarily in the industry, but that are part of our country and the economy um, about the advances that are being made? That's, that's a good question, Jared. Uh, and it certainly is part of the reason we're on the show. We've been getting the word out about what the potential is for our technology. There are a lot of other developments and, and improvements in industry that are reducing emissions, reducing footprint, and um, you know, improving that side of things. We certainly see that with investors on the global scale are looking to focus their dollars and investment in cleaner energy production. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, that's where we see Accelerware has the ability to really electrify the, the heavy oil and oil sand production space, which then means the cleaner, as Laura said, the cleaner the power, the cleaner the production. So we're trying to get the word out. We, we know that we see a lot of our, the operators in the space try to get the, that word out, but it, it tends to be hard to break through the, the mindset. So I think it's going to mm -hmm. take a continued concerted effort, and it's probably going to take some some bigger successes from companies like Accelerware or others with innovative technologies to, to get them past this pilot stage and get them commercial. Um, yeah. know, we're, work, we're working on a white paper right now to demonstrate just how we could do a zero GHG production scenario for real and, and economically profitably do that in, in today's market or, or in the very near future when we get past our current oil price um, challenges, but it, it's real and it can happen now. So, once we see that happen and I think the broader industry and society can see that that is possible, then we can maybe get a mind shift and some more attention on it. But it's, it's going to take concerted effort to change the perception of, of maybe a black and white view of what's clean and what's dirty. Um, you know, we, we position ourselves as a clean tech company. And I think there's a lot of people in, in the world that would assume you can't really be a clean tech company if you're working in oil. Um, right. And, and we can't. So we can make it much cleaner and we can support a transition from oil as a fuel to oil as a, as a petrochemical product. Uh, that's really yeah. important to, to the rest of the economy. Well, I do think, and again, this is, this is more of an opinion, um, but you know, even our company, we used to put out shorter bits of content and then we started putting out this long form content. And we thought, you know, when we put out four minute videos, people would watch for one minute. When we put out an hour video, people would watch for 20, um, you know, the average view time, you know, things like that. And we realized 
that people really will consume a lot of information. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm glad, you know, having both, you know, two representatives from your company coming on, actually walking through the technology, talking about bringing it to market, scaling it up. I mean, that for somebody who is outside looking in on the industry, now they have something to work off of. And, it, and I think what I've seen, you know, you see major companies, and I'm certainly not knocking them. I mean, they're, they're, they're just trying to get a message out, and they say stuff like clean energy, but there's no way anybody knows what that actually means. They're just, yeah. okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I'm pretty excited to have companies like Excel who are actually coming on and really taking the time. And it does take a lot of time. You got to prep for the interview and come on, and then it goes out there and it's unedited. So people, <laughs> you know, you hope you don't say the wrong thing. Thing. And there's a certain amount of risk that comes in having these long form discussions. But I think it makes all the difference um, for people outside looking in. I really do. Well, we, yeah, we appreciate that. We welcome the opportunity to get a little deeper instead of the, the quick surface pitch of all the benefits. But being able to explain how uh, this technology can make the changes that it can, I think will help build some of that credibility and understanding of what's possible and what can be just around the corner for this industry. Absolutely. Mike, thank you for coming on. Laura, thank you for joining the show. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow along. I mean, I, I hope this isn't the end of uh, your involvement with Crownsman. Um, and as the co company continues to expand, hopefully get you back on to show where we've gone to, which is another interesting thing that I think people need to see is that as companies grow and expand and go to market and, and scale up, for, to, to follow that journey. So I, I hope you'll uh, consider coming back on when we're, you sort of reach the next stage. That'd be great. Thanks, Jared. It's been great to be here. Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you for watching the show. You know, um, I will say this, you know, this new technology, I mean, there's gonna be people in the industry that are watching. We have lots of people from the energy sector, specifically in Alberta. You're, you're a huge part of our audience and we, we thank you for the support you're, you're giving us. Um, and for everybody else, um, I, I encourage, we're going to encourage you to find out more. We've got, we're going to have links to Accelerware's website and, and go through and actually learn about what this company is doing. And there's other companies that are doing amazing work in the energy sector. And, and we're here unapologetically to promote them. Um, so thank you for watching. Gaudi will uh, tell you where to go, where you can support the show. Uh, re recommend that our next guest. We are always looking for more people to feature. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you on the next episode of Crownsman Energy. Thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you would like to help support the production of the show, please head on over to crownsman.com forward slash donations, where you will find two ways of supporting the five buck monthly subscription option and the support heavy industry one time donation. Again, thank you so much for your support and uh, we will see you on the next episode.